and welcome to the Biddeford Parsonage Museum, historical residence of Lucy Maud Montgomery during 1894-95. Come in, relax, and join us for story time with Ellen Montgomery. Hi, my name is Emma Palmer, and I'm going to be reading Courage for the Occasion by L. M. Montgomery. Courage for the Occasion was written in June 1898 and published in July 1898 in Philadelphia Times. This is the Philadelphia Times. Courage for the Occasion. Also published in Ruth's Raspberrying in Churchman on July 24th, 1908. Courage for the Occasion by Ellen Montgomery. I am going to call on Bachelor Smith and ask him for a contribution, said Ruth Lawrence. The other girls looked at her in amazement, mingled with awe. Ruth was president of the North Fairford Flower Mission Band, which of, of which every North Fairford girl in her teens, and of a certain trade and society, was more or less an enthusiastic member. It was in a flourishing condition and existed for two purposes. One was to send daily bouquets to North Fairford invalids, and these were, for the most part, supplied from the girls' own gardens or from the frequent excursions to the forest and field. The other object was rather more complex. Ruth Lawrence's elder sister was a nurse in the children's ward of a large hospital in a neighboring city, and it was the aim of the flower mission to send her a certain sum monthly to be expended in flowers for the children under her care. To make up this sum was the monthly problem of the mission. The girls had various plans. They got up concerts and strawberry festivals and several other devices for coaxing the required number of dollars out of well-to-do North Fairfordians. The Sewing Society also had a timely aid, and once every year a member of the mission went around the village and canvassed for subscriptions to their pet fund. This summer, Ruth was assigned this duty and she boldly announced her intention of calling on Bachelor Smith. Bachelor Smith was not only the bachelor in North Fairford, but he was sufficiently eccentric and wealthy to be disting distinguished by some title other than playing Mr. Smith. He lived in a handsome, old-fashioned house on the one aristocratic of North Fairford, and was generally given a wide berth by anyone seeking contributions to any scheme or of church or state. Not that he was personally disagreeable, but it was well known that all charitable objects were as gall as warm wood to him. He had never been known to contribute to one cent in his life, but as, as Ruth said, there had to be a beginning to everything, and Bachelor Smith was not yet too old to learn the error of his way. If anyone might be found brave enough to attempt the teaching. The girls were of the opinion that if anyone could accomplish the teaching, Ruth could. For themselves, they would not attempt it, but Ruth was known as to be past mistress of the art of coaxing strong-hearted objections into surprised contributions, and she might even effect the transformation of Bachelor Smith. Nevertheless, Ruth did not feel all confident when she rang the bell at his front door the next afternoon. It was one thing to talk to the girls in Flower Mission Room and quite another to storm a cranky old bachelor in his sighted dale. It was too late to back out. However, so Ruth took her courage in both hands as she ushered into the library, where she was greeted by Bachelor Smith himself. Bachelor Smith was not at all a terrifying personage when nobody tramped on his pet corns. In fact, he was quite a benevolent looking and agreeable old gentleman, who received the Inchbred Flower Mission President with old-fashioned with old courtesy. Ruth had no time to waste, so she plunged resolutely into the subject on hand, and having a good start and being reasonably fluent of tongue, she contrived to state the object of her, before, of her call before Bachelor Smith could get a chance to interrupt, so that, in manner, his guns were spiked. Flower mission nonsense, he growled at last, I have no money to waste on such notions. Moreover, I consider this a, a particularly absurd one. No, young lady, I'll have nothing to do with your flowers or your missions. You had better at home be minding your work, all of you. It's a piece of useless nonsense. Oh, Mr. Smith, it isn't, pleaded Ruth. Sick people like to get flowers, and just think of all those poor little children lying in the hospital day after day. Flower do them, does them good. My sister says, Now see here, Bachelor Smith, leaning on his chair and laying himself out for argument. As I said, I consider this all nonsense, and worse than nonsense. 
It's only to amuse yourself. You fuss around half your time getting at festivals, bazaars, and so on. And you think you are working disinter disinterestedly. Whereas the truth is that if it were real hard work with no fun or gossiping and gadding around in it, nobody would ever catch you at it. You don't care a cent to those hospital children. In reality, there isn't one of you that wouldn't put yourself out or make any sort of sacrifice that, for them, if it came to that. Oh, but indeed we would, said Ruth indignantly. It isn't fair of you to talk like that, Mr. Smith. I'd be willing to do anything. I could help them. Prove it, said Bachelor Smith crisply. So I will, if you tell me how, said Ruth. Bachelor Smith looked at her with an admiring twinkle in his eye. He might not have been born without a terrible bump, but he looked at a pretty picture for all that. Well, I'll take you at your word, Miss Lawrence. If you will do as I tell you, you may convince me that fire missionaries are earnest. It is raspberry time now. A good picker can make from a dollar to a dollar and a, and a half a day. If you will go out tomorrow and pick raspberries for me a day without telling anyone your reasons for it until afterwards, I will pay you for according to the market rates, and wherever I will engage to give you five times their value for that precious mission of yours. That's a fair bargain. What do you say to it? For a moment, Ruth was dismayed. But I never picked raspberries in my life, Mr. Smith, she protested feebly. It isn't hard to learn, said her tormentor grimly, but of course you are not obligated to go. I did not expect you to do it. Ruth felt a little dizzy. She stood and committed, but to go. She, Judge Lawrence's daughter, to pick raspberries for a whole day out on the Fairford Commons, where all the rag, tag, and bobtail of the village would be, it would be humiliating, to say n nothing of material unpleasantness. But Bachelor Smith, concluding chuckle, decided it. I'll go, she said decidedly. And I shall hold you to your bargain, Mr. Smith. Bachelor Smith chuckled again. Very well, you are to go tomorrow or on the first day and pick all day. You are not allowed to tell anyone your reason for it. When you bring the berries here, I will do my prayer. She showed herself to the door him He showed her to the door himself and watched her down the street. Pretty and spunky too, he said to himself. She wouldn't be old Caleb Lawrence's daughter if she were not. Ruth felt like sitting down and having a good cry when she got home, but what Bachelor Smith would have called the old Lawrence girl was roused in her. She intended to go through the undertaking. It would have been easier if she could have told her reason. Her family stared in her wonderment when she declared her intention of picking raspberries on the commons the next day. But as they knew that Ruth genuinely had good reasons for any whim, they offered no serious objections. And in and an early hour the next morning found Judge Lawrence's dainty daughter walking bravely down the long maple-shaded street with a shining pail over each arm. She had put on a big sun hat and her plainest gingham dress and was trying to convince herself that she did not mind it after all. Fortunately, it was so early that she did not meet any of her friends, so she was spared unpleasant expectations and explanations. But Bachelor Smith was up and saw her go by. He chuckled again. Looks, if I, looks as if I were going to lose the game, he said. When Ruth was fairly out of the village and walking down the country road, she was no longer alone. It was swarming with raspberry pickers on their way to the commons. These might be divided into two classes. There were included the towsy-haired girls and the ragged urchins from Fox Valley. And other poor lo localities of North Fairford who picked raspberries for market. They were rude and saucy and did not hesitate to make imperial remarks to Ruth. One of two of the boys ventured to throw clods at her. The other pickers were gen generally, generally girls of, a, of about Ruth's age, raspberrying on their own account. They belonged to respectable families in the village or from the outlying firms. Most of them were quiet and ladylike and walked along in groups and chattered gaily. Ruth Lawrence did not know these girls. Most of them she knew quite well by sight, but they were not in her set. The line of social distinction was very sharply drawn in North Fairford. Not that Ruth was keenly alive to this. Indeed, she had seldom thought of it. There was no false part about her, but these girls knew that Ruth Lawrence and a judge's daughter. They thought her proud and exclusive and were afraid of her. All of them wondered what on earth she was going to pick raspberries for. A few of them, who were inclined to be malicious, wondered audibly, 
coupled with some sneering remarks about rich folks too mean to buy their own raspberries. That made Ruth's face flame. She felt horribly lonely. It would have been pleasant if she could have walked along with them and shared in their chat, but they avoided her. She was thankful when the long walk ended and she found herself at the commons. She went to work with grim determination. The other girls stayed off, and her small, grimy tormentors also vanished among the green thickets. Raspberry picking was not itself hard work, but the hot sun made herself ache terribly. The underbrush tore her pretty dress, and her hands got scratched and sunburned, almost to blistering. At noon, the pickers stopped for lunch. Little groups gathered here and there in jolly comradeship under clumps of bushes. Ruth sat dismayedly by herself, too tired and dispirited dispirited to eat. Presently, a tall, pleasant-faced girl left a little group that had been whispering significantly, significantly and came shyly over to Ruth. We are going down to a spring in the hollow to eat our lunch, she said awkwardly, and we thought maybe, as you are all alone, you might like to go with us. Oh, thank you, said Ruth eagerly. Yes, I would like it. I was feeling dreadfully lonesome. There were five other girls. She knew their names and where they lived. At first they were rather shy and ill at ease, but it soon wore off, and they, they found that even a girl who lived on Camwell Street and was the judge's daughter could be jolly and companionable. They ate their lunch around the cool spring and laughed and talked while they rested. Ruth discovered, with a rather surprising feeling, how really nice these girls were and what good times they had among themselves. When they returned to work, Ruth did not feel half so tired and discouraged nor did the afternoon seem so long. She picked near her new friends and joined and chatted. Still, when the sun sank at low below the fair ford fields, she was heartily thankful the day was over. Many other girls had twenty or twenty-five courts. Ruth, let's expect, only had fifteen, but they represented the hardest day she had ever done in her life. The walk home was quite pleasant. The Fox Alley contingent were too tired to render themselves obnoxious, and Ruth walked along with the other girls. They had dropped off their respective gateways. Ruth walked along thoughtfully. I suppose it was just one of the bachelor Smith's whims, she said to herself. But now I know that I have learned a great deal today besides how to pick raspberries. I don't intend to forget those girls. She was very weary and draggled, but with withal triumphant figure that presented herself at Bachelor Smith's door a little later and greeted him with a brisk, Here are your raspberries, Mr. Smith, 14 quarts at 60 cents. 90 cents, please, as purely business transaction. Mr. Smith's eyes twinkled more than ever as he counted up the money. So you did it, eh? How did you like raspberrying? Not at all, answered Ruth, frankly, but the, I did not go for the fun of the thing exactly, and I am satisfied. Bachelor Smith pr produced a folded slip of paper from Ruth's pocket. Here's my part of the bargain bargaining, young lady. The next time you come to me for a contribution to your society, perhaps may you may not find my conditions quite so hard. I believe you are in earnest, after all. Ruth did not look at the check until she was in, on the street. Then she unfolded it. It was for twenty dollars. Well, I never, she exclaimed, and that was just what every member of the fire mission said, too, when the story came out. Written June 1998, published in July.